I'm Rick Edelman. Is it possible you might never die? Stay tuned for this one. Also, if you get a financial windfall, where should you put that cash? I've got some ideas for you. And keeping your body in shape is a great investment in yourself, but so is exercising your brain. And we'll show you how in The Other Side of Money. All that and more on this edition of The Truth About Money. This program is funded in part by TD Ameritrade. At TD Ameritrade, we support investors and independent registered investment advisors every day, providing access to tools, research, and educational resources that help you pursue your goals with confidence. I'm Ed Burns. I've spent a lot of time around cameras. However, I've never actually swallowed one before. Till now. It's a camera the size of a pill that lets your doctor see inside of you. That's uh, kind of awesome. Technology is evolving. We believe the way to invest should evolve as well. A prospectus is available at 1-800-iShares, which includes investment objectives, risks, fees, expenses, and other information that you should read and consider carefully before investing. Investing involves risk, including possible loss of principal. I'm Rick Edelman. The truth about money is you need it. So how do you balance saving for your future while creating a better life for your family now? The answer makes dollars and cents. Hi, Rick. I'm 50 and I have a three-year-old daughter. I'm doing a little midlife career switch and my income's going to take a big hit this year. We're okay with the bills, but if push comes to shove, what do I fund? My retirement or my daughter's college fund? That's a great question. And when push comes to shove, shove the kid out of the house. I mean, what it really comes down to is your retirement has to come first. A lot of parents struggle with this, admittedly, because, you know, we've got kids and we feel it's an obligation to do everything we can to get those kids off on the right start. And that means paying for college. But not if it means sacrificing your own retirement. And that's something that you have to recognize must come first. There's a real simple reason for that. Your child can pay for college throughout their working career, but you cannot pay for retirement once you're in retirement. In other words, retirement must be pre-funded. And that means if you're struggling and you've only got a certain amount of money to save, you must save that money for your own retirement. And let's consider this. If you don't properly save for your retirement and you instead choose to save for your child's college education, you better hope that that child makes an awful lot of money because in retirement, you'll be living with them. From Tinseltown to Broadway, we recently asked just one question, celebrity edition. How do you remove hysteria from financial decisions? Oh, very important. Never think about it on the run. I always get a chair, sit down, get very comfortable, get very quiet, and get focused. And not let anything external bother me. I mean, I had to go to extreme ends to make money work in my life. I was a basket case. But if um, you are a single working mother, such as I am, and you can do it, Oh, it's a wonderful feeling. It's a great feeling of success. If you suddenly found yourself with a bucket full of extra cash, what would you do with it? That's one of the many questions I was asked recently during a Q&A session in Frederick, Maryland's historic Weinberg Theater. Hi, Rick. Um, I've got a question for you. My wife and I are both 60 years old. We have two grown children, uh, gainfully employed, and... Um, you are the children. Well, all of us. <laughs> um, we've just downsized our home. We sold the big house in the suburbs, bought a small, brand new townhouse right here in downtown Frederick. And uh, we walked away from that transaction with about $100,000 in cash that we'd like to use for retirement. Any suggestions on where we should put that money? Tax-free, muni bonds, an annuity, 
uh, index fund. Do you have other money in savings and investments? Yes. How much? Um, about 135000 Okay. And you're planning to retire when? Five to ten years. That's a big difference, whether it's five or ten. And would, do you expect you and your wife will retire at about the same time? No. My wife will, will probably retire sooner and me later. Okay. And that's very common. It's very, very rare for a married couple to both retire at the same time. Mm -hmm. So that makes it a little more complicated because we've got to project the income streams and, and so on. Uh, and the reason I ask, do you have other money saved in addition to this 100000 is that I want to invest this 100000 in context of the other money that you have invested. Because I don't want this money to be redundant to that money. I also don't want it to be in conflict with that money. For example, if that money is in taxable bonds, putting this money in munis wouldn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to own both taxable bonds and munis. One of those is wrong. Um, also, if you have all of your money in stocks at the moment, I wouldn't want to put this money into stocks because that would be redundant. Uh, so I'd want to make sure that we're investing in a more diversified fashion. The way you answer the question is based on the goals that we're trying to obtain. There are two different approaches when it comes to investing money. Some people have an investment management approach. Others, my preference, is a goals-based approach. For example, there are some people who say, I believe that technology is a great investment opportunity, or I'm excited about Brazil, or I'm really nervous that China is too high, or I think gold is too uh, low, or whatever they may happen to say. I love Apple, or I hate Facebook, or they, they try to buy what's hot, they try to avoid what's not. And they're not investing with anything in mind other than how can I make money. That's a very common way to invest, but it's not the way that I recommend. The way that I recommend instead is goals-based. What are we trying to accomplish? And how long do we have before we get there? For example, if retirement is in 10 years, how much income are you going to need at that point? And what are the sources of income? You have Social Security income, maybe pension income, and you're going to have investment income. So how much income are we going to have? Where's it going to come from? And is it enough for what we need? Once we focus on the goals, now I can figure out how to invest to achieve the goal. Because I may discover I only need to invest and earn 3% to get where I want to go. Or I might need to earn 8% to get there. Well, investments that earn 3 are very different from investments that earn 8. I don't want to take any more risk than I have to to get to where I want to go. So if I can achieve my goal with 3%, that's what I'm going to do. But if 3% doesn't get me to my goal, the 3 percent's a loser. So to answer your question, should I buy muni bonds, I don't know because I don't know if the interest you'd earn on munis is enough to get you where you want to go. So we need to examine it from a goals-based perspective, and that is the most effective approach. So I would recommend that you talk with a financial advisor who can evaluate all of that for you. Thank you. What is your biggest financial asset? Is it A, your house, B, your health, C, your ability to produce an income, D, your company pension or retirement plan? We'll be back with the answer right after this. Space, the final frontier, or so we've been told. But is space exploration really worth the investment? How can we profit from these missions? Astronaut Dan Barry says space exploration is crucial, not just for research, but for the very survival of humanity. Dan, you are the chair of both the robotics section and the space section for Singularity University. You obviously have been in space several times. You uh, spacewalked four times. Yep, three flights, four spacewalks. And one of the uh, leading experts, obviously, in, in, in that field. It make the case, because a lot of folks wonder the incredible expense associated with space flight sure. and space travel, make the case for why it's important from a science perspective, from a human perspective, that we continue to explore sure. space. 
Well, first of all, I would argue it's not very expensive. Uh, we spend about right now about a half a percent of the federal budget on NASA. One half of one percent. One half of one percent. So it's, it's, it's not a big agency, let's put it that way. Uh, at the same time, it's serious money. So, so we do have to understand you know, how that money's getting spent. And the first thing I would say to you is it's an investment in the future. You know, why do you go to college? Why do you spend money to go to college as opposed to buying a house? Because you want to invest in your personal future. You want to learn things that are going to do uh, positive things for you in the future. So why should we, for example, go to Mars? Mars is the number one place right now where we could go and find life that is fundamentally different than life on Earth. If we go to Mars, a place that we know was warm and wet and it was conducive to the, to the forms of life that, that we understand exists right here, if we, if we go there and find life that's not DNA-based, that's fundamentally different than life on Earth, we can demonstrate that life arose in two places independently, we've answered the question. It means we're not alone. It means that the billions of planets like Earth that are all around our galaxy are going to have life on them. And it's not a matter of whether ET exists, it's a matter of why haven't we found them and let's look a little harder. So I'd really like to know if we're alone, and Mars offers the opportunity to answer that question. Suppose we go there and we find Mars is totally sterile, no evidence for life at all, none, zip, zero, and we continue to look at, you know, with telescopes at the stars and we don't find any evidence for life. Could it really be that we're alone? Are we it? And if that's the case, then the second reason to go to Mars becomes ever so much more important. And that is that Mars guarantees the survival of the human species. Right now, one thing wipes out this species. Asteroid impact, ecologic runaway, crazy bioterror, who knows? We all live on one planet. We become a multi-planet species. We put a colony on Mars that's independent of Earth, and that's doable. It's not like, could we do that? We can do that. Once we do that, Star Trek will happen. Because no one event can wipe out the human species. The human species becomes immortal on the day we make an independent colony on Mars. So just as I, as a financial advisor, encourage diversification among investments, <laughs> you're encouraging diversification in terms of where we live. Yeah, I mean, a multi-planet species is an immortal species. There's nothing that can kill us. The, once we get on Mars, it'll be the Martians that then go to the rest of the planets and the other moons in the solar system, and it'll be those people that then go to the stars. And this species will occupy the galaxy. There'll be nothing that can, that can stop it. From robots to 4D printing, each week on The Truth About Money, we'll examine the financial implications of technologies like these and how they are reshaping our world. What is your biggest financial asset? The answer is C, your ability to produce an income. Balancing risk and return is the key to protecting your financial future, but sometimes, you also need to consider what will happen if you're not here to protect your family's financial future. Dudley, he's from Springfield. Thanks for taking my call. My wife and I are currently both active duty in the Air Force, and uh, we're both around 25 years in service. Uh, she's getting ready to retire this year, and we were presented with the option to sign up for the Survivor Benefit Program. Now, being the resident of the National Capital Region, I'm sure you might be familiar with that because I know you have a lot of military folks that... Right. Um, yeah, we, have, we work with lots of uh, military clients, sure. Well, obviously, uh, both being active duty and me probably retiring in a couple of years from active duty, her, like I said, this summer, uh, we both would be presented with the opportunity to sign up for that program. And, of course, active duty, your pension... Once the active duty or once the, the veteran uh, passes, their pension ends, and then you, you can participate in the survivor ben benefit program to varying percentages of income or not. And you decide that before the, um, the active duty person retires, and then that's it. And I your question, you your question is whether or not to do it any general comments about right. active duty, uh, active duty spouses without children. Gotcha. Well, first of all, uh, before we answer your question, uh, Dudley, I, uh, I just want to say thank you to you and your wife for your service to our nation. Oh, well, you're welcome. And thank you. It's a privilege. Yeah. One thing that Dudley said was that they don't have children and that might play a part on whether or not they take survivor benefit. But Dudley, what I would recommend doing is because your wife is close, I suspect you have an estimate on the amount that she is going to receive from this pension. The 
gross payment, the monthly pension is about $3,600 from the DOD. Okay, so you're talking about over $40,000 a year. So this is the question you have to ask each other. If you don't select F SBP, if your wife does not, and she um, passes away several years after she retires, that forty grand is gone. It does not continue to you in any way. So you've got to take a look at what are your income needs slash goals, and would you be okay if you lost that $40,000? In many, or I'd say most cases, it's important to take that option. And I think- To protect that money. Check Absolutely. Well, how much will it get cut if he if, if it's forty grand uh, about, as a single life? It's about six and a half percent is the reduction for the military survivor benefit option. So we're right, going to work premium, right? So our, our net monthly would would her net monthly. I'm sorry, we're both at the same rank. So if we retired right now, we both would. And well, I guess that's a moot point if both of us passed away. But if she were to pass away, my benefit, my fifty five, it would be fifty five percent of her of her gross. Um, so it, so Brandon's right math is, is the simple question that you need to ask yourself, Dudley. Can you live without your wife's pension? Right. And, and if the answer is no, then you have the question of whether or not you take the survivor pension or whether or not you consider some type of pension maximization strategy where you ensure your wife's life instead of buying the survivor pension. On military, we find that almost never works because of the way that structure is set up. It's tax-free money you use to pay the premium. It's a guaranteed issue, uh, and it's non-cancelable. I want to emphasize this point for you, Dudley. We see this all the time. Mm -hmm. The notion, as Anderson has described, is exactly that. You take the single life only, which increases the, your wife's pension. You take some of that increase and buy life insurance so that when she dies and the pension goes away, the life insurance kicks in to replace the pension that you lost by her death. You will discover as you approach retirement and this decision that you and your wife will be contacted by life insurance salespeople who are going to sell you that exact pitch. They're going to say, take the higher income, use some of it to buy life insurance. And as Anderson has pointed out, in the case of the military, as well as federal employees, right. it almost never makes economic sense. That is That's not right. the case in the private sector. We often discover in the private sector that it does work, and that's because the private sector's pensions are not nearly as generous as those in the military and the federal government. I have seen cases where former military officers who have now taken second careers as insurance salesmen go back to their brethren saying, hey, I'm in the Air Force. I was in the Air Force like you. I'm a military retiree. I am just like you, and let me show you what I can do for you. It's an affinity sale, and it can be very disarming, which is an ironic phrase to use with military <laughs> personnel. And so I want you to have your guard up, which is another ironic <laughs> phrase for military personnel, so that you are defending yourself. I got a second. That's impressive. I want a fourth. <laughs> so that you can counterattack the pitch and uh, protect yourself and your wife. So go with the survivor benefit plan. Even if you aren't sure you need it, the reduction in pay in retirement isn't very much, and the safety net is of, of very high value. Well, I certainly appreciate your time and expertise on giving me feedback on this. Very helpful. And it's our pleasure to talk with you. Thanks again, and thanks again for your service, Dudley. When you're flat broke, you can't even afford to laugh, unless, of course, you're a comic, and then it's your job to make people laugh at your expense. I took the uh, Amtrak down here from New York, and uh, I like that train. I like the Acela train, right? Don't they have a great pitch? What a great pitch. We'll get you to DC nine minutes faster for only 400 extra dollars. <laughs> Sign me up. That's literally just people wanting to flaunt that they have money. There's no actual purpose. It's like, look at the peasants getting on their train. We'll see them nine minutes from now. I still have my SUV. I bought it when everything was going great and we were fighting wars and gas was like a buck. Like the other day I pull up to an intersection and a little Euro guy comes up next to me in a sports car, a lot of chest hair, some gold on him. <laughs> I'm like, well, all right, bro, it's all, all good. You know, let's just hang out at the intersection, wait for the light to change. He didn't like my attitude. He's like, mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, all right, Euro dude. Let's get down like this. Mm -hmm. That's $20, people. That's a waste of money in the SUV. 
It doesn't count as a win in drag racing if you beat the guy off the line and turn left into an Exxon before the next intersection. It's not a win. I really wanted, growing up, I must have been the only kid in my neighborhood in like the late 80s, early 90s who did not have a Nintendo. I wanted video games so badly as a kid, I used to make up games to play with the digital clocks in the house. <laughs> you know, which one's gonna say 6.30 first? And living room clock, a hall clock, go, hall clock, go. I wanted a Nintendo so badly, I, I used to pick mushrooms on the way to school. I was trying to get bigger, you see. I stepped on all the turtles I saw. One day I did a good job in school, the teacher gave me a gold star. I just started running into everything. Those of you who never played Mario Brothers have no idea what the hell I'm talking about. There you go, that's okay. <laughs> that's all right. My parents didn't, uh, they didn't talk to me about finances, but I don't think most parents talk to their kids about finances. You know, my, my parents would speak at like with a, like biblical prophets that would throw little things out like, put something away for a rainy day. What the hell does that mean? I have no idea what that meant when you're growing up, right? Now, like, now I have a closet full of board games and galoshes. It's like, <laughs> you know, really. Well, I guess I won't get bored or wet while I'm living under the underpass, you know. If you could ask a financial advisor just one question, what would it be? Here's one we hear from a lot of people. What estate planning mistakes do you commonly see people make? Retirement isn't necessarily stopping working. It, it, it's more of a reorientation. What do you want to do? I have a client right now who's actually just putting in time to be able to get the pension and then will, is looking forward to the job of being um, a starter at the, the local golf course. I tell them this, life is a windshield, not a rear view mirror. We're gonna start from here and we're gonna get you up the road. So don't, don't beat yourself up, don't look back. We're just gonna look forward. One client told me for, for all the time I'm at work, that's time that I'm not out spending money. So even though they're not earning that much, they're actually going to be saving more because they're not out spending and doing other things. If you're like most of us, you could benefit from exercising a little more every week. We can see and feel the difference when we work out regularly. Our bodies get stronger and the same thing happens with our brains. That too needs regular exercise. Here's my business partner, co-founder of our firm, and my wife. Jean shows us how to do exercises for our brain in The Other Side of Money. So we want to exercise our brain just like we would exercise any muscle in our body. And the way that we exercise our brain is one, like our body, we feed it well. We feed it fresh fruit and vegetables. We exercise it by getting uh, great oxygen to our brain. That could be out running or inside doing whatever you do, like an elliptical, just something where you're breathing and you're getting oxygen to your brain. We need to feed it well. We need to give it good nutrition. And that's what helps keep our brain healthy. We have a left side of our brain and our right side of our brain. And our left side is our logical, you know, day to day. And our right side is our artistic, our creative piece. So we want to give a chance to find that balance. Activities of art, music are that right-sided activity. And the, the puzzles and the math, that's that left side. And so finding the activities that kind of work that other side of the brain, that's the best thing we can do for ourselves. A brain on vacation is a brain in the garden, it's a brain that's jogging, it's a brain that's doing a crossword puzzle or Sudoku, or I always like those word puzzles. Give it tasks that are kind of what we would consider mindless. It's just kind of shifting what we're doing as something quiet and gives our brain a chance to relax a little bit. We give it something that it can kind of relax and figure out and doesn't have to be kind of stressed to, to find uh, the answer. The end goal for all of us is happy. And when our body and mind are happy and balanced, we don't have a lot of stress, we have plenty of time in our day for ourselves, that's a happy person and that's a happy life. Thanks, Gene. Keeping our brains sharp and in shape will help us make the most of our golden years. And who knows, we might even live long enough to see humans colonize Mars. A few final words to keep in mind. Remember, you need to take the emotion out of investing. And when you do invest, make sure you diversify to help reduce your risks 
and severity of losses. That's the truth about money. I'm Rick Edelman. See you next time. To learn more about the topics we discussed on this episode and a chance to ask your questions, visit our website at truthaboutmoneytv.com and stay connected by liking us on Facebook and following us on Twitter.